Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to Virtually Watch, Ask an Economist, Where Are We Now?, hosted by the Vanderbilt Project on Unity and American Democracy, to answer your questions on the U.S. economy and hopefully cut through some of the jargon and campaign talking points. My name is Kelly Goldsmith, and I am the E. Bronson Ingram Chair and Professor of Marketing at Vanderbilt University's Owen Graduate School of Management. And fun fact about me, I am a non-economist. So I am just like you, excited to learn from these experts today and excited to get them to translate some of what I've heard in the media into language I can actually understand. Now, speaking of these experts, joining me today is Dr. Mark Zandi, Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, where he directs economic research. Mark has been a longtime trusted advisor to policymakers and an influential and credible source of economic analysis for businesses, journalists, and the public. Mark is on the board of directors of MGIC, the nation's largest private mortgage insurance company, and is the lead director of Reinvestment Fund, one of the nation's largest community development financial institutions, which makes investments in underserved communities. Thank you for joining us. Kelly, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. My pleasure. Also joining us in this conversation is Dr. Douglas Holtz Aiken, founder and president of the American Action Forum. Doug has served in a variety of influential policy decisions throughout his career, including chief economist of the President's Council of Economic Advisors in 2001 and 2002. Doug was also the director of domestic and economic policy for John McCain in John McCain's 2008 presidential campaign, and after served as commissioner on the congressionally chartered Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. Mark, Doug, thank you both for being a part of this important and timely conversation today. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Now, Mark, you were part of the first installment of Ask an Economist last September with the Unity Project. Here we are, one whole year later, still talking about the economy. So to get us started, can you answer the question, where are we now? What has changed since last September when many were concerned about the recession risk and global supply chains being disrupted? Well, um, thank you for having me back. That must mean I got at least half of what I said last year right. I, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I'm sure I'm sure it was okay if you had me back. Well, there you, go. you know, I'm pretty sure a year ago I would I would probably have said the economy was struggling. Uh, recession risks are high, but with a little bit of luck and some reasonably deft policymaking by the uh, Federal Reserve, we'd be able to manage through without a recession. And I think that's kind of sort of what's happened over the past year. And I kind of sort of think that's where we are today. It feels like recession risks are lower than they were a year ago uh, because inflation is lower than it was a year ago. I mean, if you go back a year ago, inflation, consumer price inflation, CPI inflation was probably at the time 7 8% year over year. You know, just for context, the Fed wants inflation somewhere kind of in the twos. Uh, right now we're uh, three, four percent ish, you know, depending on which top line inflation or core inflation. So we're moving in the right direction. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Of course, the Fed is pushed up interest rates aggressively, and we'll keep rates there until we are within spitting distance of that, you know, two percent target. But all the trend lines feel well. Most of the trend lines feel pretty good to me. There's a few things that I'm an economist, you know, so. Things make me make me nervous, and we can talk sure. about that. But broadly yeah. speaking, I think we're moving in the right direction. And hopefully, if you ask me back a year from now, we can say, you know, mission accomplished. We're we're back to target inflation, and the coast is reasonably clear. No recession. So, Mark, as a veteran of the Bush administration, don't say mission accomplished ever. Oh, good point. <laughs> good point. Good point. Good point. <laughs> I should remember that. Yes. Yeah. Stand. <laughs> Stand. Yeah. Well, Doug, I'd love to hear from you. Beyond what Mark has said, what do you think has been a win from an economist's view in the past year? So I, I first want to uh, independently verify that Mark, in fact, is the guy who said there wouldn't be a recession. We we, we happened to be on a panel a little more than a year ago. And, you know, he, he said, I'm saying right now we're going to get through without a recession. So he's not making that up. That's that's not doctoring the, the facts after, after. Oh, you're very kind to say. I really appreciate oh. that. You're so, very kind. Um, so he was right. I was more pessimistic. I, I really was. And I think the surprises uh, in the past year have been twofold. Um, one, inflation has come down much more rapidly with less pain than I think anyone expected. 
And I, I can point to some things that helped, but it doesn't uh, um, make it all true. Number one, um, we've gotten a lot of help on declining energy prices around uh, over the past six months. That looks like it's starting to reverse, but that was that was a big part of the top line success. But that isn't everything. Uh, core inflation doesn't have that in there. So the second thing that happened is uh, really um, China's slowing, and in general, import prices are, are down over the past year. And, and so that on on the goods front, the inflation problem has really gone away. All that's left is some services inflation. Um, and and on, and the last bonus has been we had really strong productivity growth in the first half of this year, and that. That makes everything easier because if you have productivity growth, you can pay higher wages and not have to raise your prices. And so that those those three have gone in the right direction. It's made it better. Hope they persist. Can't guarantee it. Um, and the second thing that happened um, ha- is has been that business spending has held up better than I expected. Most people spend all their time staring at the the household spending data. We're obsessed with the American consumer, but the reality is that. The only recession in the post-war period that began with consumers pulling back was the pandemic. Hmm. People didn't go out and spend because they didn't want to go out. It wasn't safe. Um, Every other recession starts with a downturn, typically in business capital expenditures. And a couple quarters later, uh, household spending falls off, usually because there's been some layoffs or fears entered into the equation. And so I was I thought that we might see that dynamic. And, And last year, business spending was looking a little weak to me. Uh, and it firmed up this in the first half of this year. That's been to me the the big good news. And I'm not sure I can explain it entirely. The Fed's raising rates. There's lots of reasons why it should go the other way, but but it's held up pretty well. Well, that's good to hear. And I will say, you talk about being obsessed with the American consumer. I am a consumer psychologist. So I too, I'm very deeply <laughs> obsessed with the American consumer. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to hear I'm not alone in that. Now, I actually, I was, I was tasked with an important duty here on this call, which is that I was told if you use any terms that us lay people, us non-economists might not understand, I needed to pause and double click on that and get you to offer up some definitions. So one thing you mentioned was core inflation. How is core inflation different from non-core inflation? So core inflation is inflation in non-food, non-energy prices. So food and energy prices tend to be fairly volatile. OPEC wiggles this, oil prices go that. And we, everyone's seen that movie. Uh, if historically, harvests were good or bad and prices went up. But, you know, we, with the uh, invasion of Ukraine, we saw big disruptions in global food markets. And so if you take those uh, prices out, you have a better measure of the trend in inflation. So if you're trying to figure out policy-wise what, what it might be, uh, that, that's a better measure. That doesn't mean people aren't paying those prices. It's important th- right. to you know remember that the pain of high food and gas prices is real. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that makes perfect sense to me. And certainly if you take out something that's just by natu- kind of my nature more volatile, you get a better perspective on the actual trend line. That makes a lot of sense. And certainly as a consumer psychologist, I can tell you people do pay it and they do feel the pain. That's something that I read a yeah. lot about. Now, you also mentioned the term productivity growth. Yeah. So can you just describe for us lay folks exactly what that means? Um, productivity is uh, output per worker. So it, it's, it's easy to imagine productivity if you make things like you make roofing shingles and and you used to be able to make you know uh, two tons in a day and now you can make four tons you, you you got doubled the productivity you can pay the person twice as much and and with the sales cover those costs it's great um i run a think tank productivity is harder to measure um, but but the the basic notion is that you've got workers who are generating more and it, and it gives you the ability to manage uh uh your cost structure more easily okay Fantastic. Now we touched on the good things that have happened in the past year, which is fantastic. I would throw this out to either one of you. Have there been any notable setbacks, any red flags in the past year that we should probably start paying attention to? You want me to take a crack at it, Doug? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Well, we got a bunch of kind of headwinds like right in our face, you know, at least going to start blowing right in our face here pretty quickly. I mean, there's the UAW strike that we'll see how that plays out. United Auto Workers, right? United Auto Workers, you know, the strike, yeah, there you go, the big three. Um, So we'll see how that plays out. You know, right now, it doesn't feel like a big deal, but the longer it goes on, the more factories that are disrupted, the bigger the deal it becomes. Student, uh, people with student loans are going to have to start repaying uh, in October. Uh, We can talk about what that's, you know, 21 million student loan borrowers need to start paying again. Uh, You've got uh, a potential shutdown uh, with the federal government. And I will say, 
you know, I've seen a lot of federal government shutdowns. Doug's seen, seen them up front and personal. And I don't know how, how he's thinking about this, but, uh, you know, I've never seen such a disparity in views with regard to how this is going to play out. It, I think there's this total confusion. And that makes me nervous. We have oil well, prices. I can relieve you of being nervous on that front. Okay. They are going to shut the federal government. Okay. Stop. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but how long, you know, uh, you know well, how are they going to figure it? How are they going to settle it? They've got to come to some kind of agreement. Yeah. Oil prices, I don't know if you've been watching, uh, you know, yeah. going back to your consumer psychology, nothing is more, you know, painful for the American consumer than having to pay more at the pump. Yeah. You know, and no, there's no more visible price. Nothing undermines confidence more quickly than, and I think four dollars a buck for a gallon of regular oil and lead. And I'm actually paying Nashville, but here in Philly, four dollars is kind of the threshold. I think that's kind of the national average. That's kind of a threshold I think in people's minds with regard to. Okay, I, I can live with below four, above four. I'm getting pretty upset. Yeah. Uh, we got mortgage rates that are back over seven percent, and that seems to be another threshold. The housing market goes goes. Ice cold at seven, uh, people stop buying homes and house prices start falling. So these, you know, any one of these things, Kelly, you know, under most scenarios, no big deal. But you know, you add it all up, and if something doesn't stay exactly on the rails, you know, that could be a problem. Uh, the economy is already pretty fragile given the high interest rates. So I, I think we've got some challenges dead ahead here. Okay, that's that. That's the right list. I, I, I would raise uh, the housing market a little higher on the list. I think I had hoped that by September, we'd start to see some recovery from the the, the really, I mean, the housing has been in an absolute recession. It's It got hit the most uh, severely by the rate increases. And uh, you, you sort of hope that you, they can get pa past that, but it hasn't really happened yet. And um, so that's an important vehicle of, of, of uh, short-term economic growth. And, and it doesn't look like it's gonna get back on the field uh, very quickly. I'm worried about the household. I, having said I'm not, um, among the weaknesses that seems to have developed over the, the past year is uh, uh, consumer confidence seems to steadily take hits. I think it's gas prices. Those, those often yeah. like the same thing. But also the, 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 uh, the personal saving rate has declined fairly sharply in the past couple of months. So I'm worried that um, you know, people are, are continuing to spend, but they're doing it in, in ways that involve a lot more debt and, and may not be able to to to, to keep it up. H having said all that, I mean, you know, the unemployment rate is only 3.8% and wage growth starting to look much better. And so the, there are sources of income. They, it, it's not like they're on life support. They, they, right. It, it's a concern. Yeah, I see that. We want people taking care of their own. To anyone listening, take care of your own financial future and have a solid right. sense of financial well-being for sure. Um, as much as we businesses and we marketers, right, like to it, like to see consumer spending. Uh, I wanted to go back and double click on something Mark had mentioned about the strikes. So it we mentioned the UAW, United Auto Workers. There's also the Screen Actors Guild. There's also the Writers Associations. What impact do these prominent strikes have on worker compensation, if any, and also on the broader U.S. economy? Well, I, I don't think the Screen Actors Guild and the writer's strike have deep supply chain implications, but the, the UAW strike does. Um, you know, at the moment, it's it's a very what I think of as a very cleverly managed strike. Uh, they have historically struck against all three of the big three, which they've never done before, but they've done it on a very limited scale, so that they've kept the damage to a minimum. But if it spreads more broadly to more of the factories of the big three. The 4,000 firms in the supply chain start to see their orders go away, and that's where you get the, the economic pain. And, and that takes three months, maybe two and a half months. I don't know the exact number, but it's it's worth keeping an eye on. It's, it's not an issue yet, but it, it could be. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's not that it, in, the, in the macroeconomic scheme of things, it's, it's unless it goes on for months and it disrupts most production by the big three, it's not going to be that big a deal. Uh, right. You know, uh, it's a deal. It's not great. Again, in the context of all those headwinds that we were talking about. So don't want to see it, but you know, it, it would take a, a pretty lengthy strike, a pretty dark kind of strike here for it to really do a lot of damage. Uh, but let me say with regard to your broader point about the strikes, I mean, it does, it's symptomatic of a very tight labor market. I mean, the labor yeah. market is tight. 
and the dynamics between worker and their employer has ch has changed. It, by the way, that that was going to change probably even with or without a pandemic because of demographics, the aging out of the workforce by baby boomers and less immigration. The labor market was going to be tight unless AI came along and raised those productivity raised productivity growth that Doug, Doug was talking about, which may happen. But you know, barring that. Uh, but then the pandemic came along and that scrambled uh, the labor market, right? In, in terms of participation rates and still to this day, you know, participation rates of uh, of older Americans is still very low. I mean, mm. I didn't know this before the pandemic, but apparently a lot of folks retire and then they come back. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that. That's uh, very common. I, very yeah, common. I, I did not know that. So, but what happened in the pandemic, people left, but they're not coming back. Mm. So that's a, kind of a hole in the participation rate. But then also a foreign immigration, which has fortunately picked up recently, but I'm sure, you know, is also disrupted. So the combination of these broader demographic trends that were in place prior to the pandemic and then the pandemic has made the labor market, you know, uh, very, very tight. And the, 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 the negotiating power has shifted between workers and their employers. And that's that's evident in these labor market actions, the yeah. UAW, the the strike of the actors and the writers. And there's there's if you, you can go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, a uh, government agency that kind of tracks, you know, strike activity. And it's it is very elevated by the standards of the last 30 years. I mean, it's mm. very elevated. So just two, two little footnotes of things Mark mentioned. I've spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. First of all, that that second career, you know, you retire, you go home, you hang out with your spouse. Six months later, you think, yeah, I think I need a job. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, that I, I always thought of it as the Walmart greeter effect, right? People go back mm -hmm. and become a Walmart greeter, but no one does that in a pandemic. And so it, it really did shut that down. That has restarted in the most recent data. So there's that's starting to see that again. And we've seen female labor force participation recover. It's actually at record highs, uh, prime age female labor force participation. It, but we are missing prime age males. Mm -hmm. And and it remains a bit of a puzzle um, to try to figure out exactly why that they have not returned to work. I, one of my deep fears is that a lot of it may be explained by opioid addiction and the consequences of that. Because we've seen in, in the numbers we've tried to put together million to two and a half million potential candidates uh, uh, out of the labor force because of that. So so if, if all of that somehow got cleaned up, that that's a whole bunch more people available to make stuff. It rebalances the, the labor market. It takes a lot of inflation pressure off. I think if you had to pick the silver bullet for our, our current economic uh, concerns, that's it. But I, I can't count on it. Okay. So what I'm learning from Doug, number one, save for your future. Number two, don't do drugs. There you go. Please. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so, well, speaking about this shift in power and workers' compensation and kind of this notion that in a tight labor market, really the, the workers can have more influence than perhaps otherwise, we can talk a little bit about the uh, federal minimum wage. Now, the federal minimum wage has not increased since 2009. From an economist standpoint, which is to say from your standpoints, um, what's a reasonable minimum wage right now and why? So I'm not a fan of the minimum wage at all, really. Um, and and the the reason is that we have better tools to accomplish the same goal. You would like to have people be well compensated for their work. And we have earned income tax credits that compensate people more generously for the work they do and, and have been successful and I think should be, uh, you know, the continued mainstay. The, the minimum wage has has some drawbacks that just you just don't run into with the ITC. Um, it's it's really incredibly poorly targeted. Lots of very affluent families have minimum wage uh, uh, members. And so when you raise their wage, you've, you're not solving a, a poverty problem. It's, it's incredibly poorly tar targeted. Um, it will have uh, some negative uh, employment consequences. There's a big fight about how big that is, but it's either small or significantly negative. And in, and in the process, what you would do is you would redistribute income from someone who's not going to get a job to someone who's in a job. And that's a perverse form of redistribution. So I just prefer not to spend a lot of time on the minimum wage and go to other things that reward work. Well, Mark, what do you think? I think it's important to point out that the federal minimum wage is increasingly less important in the yes. in, in yes. reality because states and local governments have yeah. decided on their own, we're going to raise the minimum wage uh, in, in some places. The, the the levels are quite high. So uh, for most workers, 
and I haven't looked at the recent data, but I would suspect a very small percentage of the workforce now is, you know, at the federal minimum wage, you know, maybe in parts of the sub- southern U.S. where wages right. are generally low. I, I'm OK with raising the federal minimum wage to be at some minimum level, probably definitely higher than it is today, just so that people don't get abused, you know, mm-hmm. the, the taken yeah. advantage of. And it's not going to have any material to Doug's concern about, you know, taking jobs. It, it won't have any material impact on on that. So I think that's that's a reasonable thing to do. But I I'm of the mind that, you know, I think it's important for uh, states, local governments to kind of uh, decide, you know, through the election process and the debate, you know, what is the appropriate minimum wage? Because it is a balance, right? I mean, everybody wants to help low wage workers. If you raise the minimum wage too high, you cost people jobs. And so that's, you're just not productive. But on the other hand, you want, don't want people to be taken advantage of. So there's a balance there. And I'd let state and local governments kind of figure out what the kind of a minimum federal wage that you know, to make, just make sure that people aren't being taken taken advantage of. That's just Mark channeling his inner 1930s because that was the original intent of the minimum wage. Yeah. And it's only when it became an income support policy that we started getting in trouble because then you attempted to raise it too high and mm-hmm. have negative consequences. And I totally agree with Doug. I mean, there's the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, you know, is probably a very good, that's a very good way to try to help, uh, you know, folks, uh, low wage workers because the, uh, you know, a, a way to incent work. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a, there is some debate about who actually benefits from the EITC, whether it's the employer or the employee, but I think that's a, a more reasonable, just all else being equal, probably a better way to go. Okay. You guys are getting along. I love it. Yeah, now I want to go we, back we to- uh, do. We typically do, you know, we could run for office. Perfect. I, that could be president. I could be VP. Um yeah, that, 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 that's not, that. <laughs> sounds like a really horrible plan, Mark. <laughs> no, yeah, you need anyone to do your marketing. It. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> It'd be a disaster. <laughs> no, you're not. I think it would be great. You're not giving yourself enough credit. Well, no, going you're just, back, you're just um, marketing just, now. You're just saying stuff. You're just, yes. Just, well, yeah. that's what marketers do. We just say yeah, stuff. Right. That's why I'm not an economist. <laughs> um, yes. Correct. Um, going back to something you guys were saying now. Now, Mark had mentioned he has this fear of a government shutdown. Doug says, "Don't don't fear it because it's hundred percent happening." Yes. Let's just assume Doug is correct here, and the government is shutting down for the lay people <laughs> watching who are internally quaking. Can you illuminate what this means for our viewers? So, what? Why do we shut down the government? What are the effects? What do we hope this is going to do? So, um, uh, th- th- this is the way this works. Um, Republicans. Uh, can't lose five votes in the House of Representatives and, and pass a bill. And there are five Republicans on record as saying they will not vote for a stopgap funding bill to temporarily ex- extend funding for the government. That's the typical mechanism for solving this. And there is no agreement between the House and the Senate on the the actual funding of the government. And so they have the capability to close the government and they want to. And so they will. Um, and And the... The reason is this. In the end, what will happen is the Senate will will fund the government with a massive omnibus appropriations bill. And you hear all sorts of awful things about this huge bill. It will pass in a bipartisan fashion because they need 60 votes. It will be supported by the White House because you don't pass something that they're going to veto. And the White House will be telling House Democrats, you need to, to, um, to vote for this. And so in a bipartisan fashion, this will pass the Senate, pass the House, go to the president, he'll sign it, which means that these very conservative House Republicans will get rolled in the end. Hmm. They know that. I know that. You now know that. It's it's an open secret. And so the only way they can make their point is some dramatic gesture. And the gesture they have is, is the one you hear about. And there is no bill that can pass the House on purely Republican votes and the Senate. And the Democrats aren't going to uh, save the Republicans from themselves. So the first round has to be, Let's do something with all Republican votes. It'll fail. And here we go. And then we'll, then we'll pick up the pieces. So now, now to the substance. We'll close it. I don't think for very long. Right. And if you if you close the federal government, two thirds of the employees continue to work. They're labeled essential. So security checks go out. Um, you know, all sorts of the military continues to function. Uh, we, we make up their lost pay after the fact and we make them whole. Uh, there's very little big macro impact of shutting the government for a short period of time. 
there's lots of nuisance value. Mm. Like if you bought a home and it's in a floodplain, you're not going to be able to get a new flood insurance policy. So you won't be able to close. And that's going to irritate people. Like you finally got a home, you can't close and you can't get your passport renewed. And you go through the sort of normal functions of government and they're not happening. And then people start calling their congressman and it ends. And, and, and that's how it should happen. And let's hope that that's the way this plays out. Because there's really no virtue to shutting the government. There's none. Does that make you feel better, Mark? Worse? Uh, I, I think he's right. I hope he's right. It, 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 I mean, that's history, right? I mean, we've had many yep. shutdowns. The longest in history, I believe, was in 2019 under President Trump. It lasted, what, almost a month. Yeah. month. I mean, the politics of this are just so bad, right? I mean, people yeah. get, you know, federal government employees don't get paid. Contractors yeah. don't get paid. Then, it, but, as Doug says, it, it makes a mess so out of all kinds of pain. Yeah, it makes a mess out of people's lives for no good reason, and they get really angry. And yeah, they're going to blame somebody, and they're going to blame the House Republicans. So how long? And now we're in a, coming up in an election year. Right. They got a five four five vote majority. I mean, really, this is what you want to do? I mean, and, come on. And and the thing that's you know you know if you, if you just watch this this play unfold, it is it is the Republicans in New York State and California where they picked up a lot of seats in the last election and they're sitting in districts that used to be held by Democrats mm. who know this is a, this is a real threat to their reelection and they're begging their colleagues not to do this and their colleagues do not care. It's, it's, it's a ridiculous uh, situation. Having said that though, you know, what, what does this mean about governance in general? I mean, you know, this it's is coming bad. on the heels of the debt limit debacle you know, we saw the rating agency Fitch downgrade the debt, which by itself doesn't mean anything, but it is but symbolic. It reaffirms the Fitch conclusion that, you know, yeah, that the governance all of managing our finances. Yeah, I mean, it's a mess. And so and then, you know, we will have another debt limit on the other side of the election in early 2025. What is this? You no, know, a lot depends on how the election goes and what the right. makeup of government is after the election. But almost under any scenario, it does feel like that's going to be a pretty ugly point in time because the other thing that's going on at that point in time is the trump tax cuts for high income high net worth households expire so we're going to, you know, republicans want to renew that what are you going to do about that and then i think there's a bunch of obama health care yeah. subsidies that expire the democrats want to do that. so we got you know we're coming together and this even though we might get through this government shutdown reasonably whole without a lot of damage you know what does that say about what, what's coming next so, I mean, you're exactly right. The shutdown's the good news. The bad news is what's <laughs> on the other side with, with the fiscal pro challenges we face. I mean, yeah. no one is serious about dealing with them, and, and they are real. So, you know, that's incredibly troubling. There's a there's a, another lesson here for people who, who don't live their lives watching these things. In the debt ceiling deal, they tried to legislate good governance, they they came they came to a supposed agreement on how much we would spend to fund the government in the in the next fiscal year, and they put in a provision to um, that was against having continuing resolutions, so that there would be an agreement on the amount of spending, and they would do the regular appropriations bill, and everything would be done in regular order, and we'd be back to operating the government successfully. And they reneged on all of it, so you can't legislate good behavior, and and you know it it has got to be the norms of the, the parties and the voters that dictate how, how they behave in these offices. I, uh, Kelly, I, there was like so many clicks there. Really, you're going you're gonna to make them go define all those terms? <laughs> I mean, I was really going to write them all down and make them define them, but it was going fast and furious. Please don't do it. Lie. Don't do it, Kelly. We could be here all day long. You yeah, know? exactly. I know. I know. I've got a clock I'm on. I'm, I was told this is going to be 40 minutes. And I keep looking ahead to my next question, which is so fitting, given what you guys are discussing. So I'm just going to barrel straight through that. There you go. Um, if you guys have, if anyone viewing is mad at me for not double clicking on all of his uh, acronyms, you just uh, shoot an email to Kelly. Dot goes with at vanderbilt.edu. No, no, right. don't do that. Yeah, do that. Do yeah, it to do Doug. That. Send it to Doug. Give, oh, go, Doug. 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 Fair <laughs> enough. Harass Doug. That's right. All right. Well, I'm turning. You talked about the upcoming election. We talked about the future that we all have in sight. Post government shutdown, what comes next? Now, considering the upcoming election, the economy is, of course, going to be a major topic among the candidates. But the question is, does the campaign rhetoric actually match the reality such that do presidents even really control that much that's relevant to the economy? Or are they just the person we blame when the going gets tough? You want me to go first? First, Mark. Yeah, I, I think presidents really matter. 
in crises, when things are really going off the rails, uh, like they did during the pandemic or the financial crisis, you know, what uh, the leadership uh, shown by the president at the time is critical to uh, addressing that crisis. I think the president can have an impact on long-term economic growth, uh, difficult to pass economic legislation uh, to address long-term challenges. But I'd say President Biden did, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not being political and we can debate the merits of the, what legislation was passed, but it's going to have mer- bearing on the long-term economy, growth in the economy, everything from the infrastructure bill, which expands out the spending on everything, roads and bridges and broadband, to the CHIPS Act, which is, you know, critical to national security and uh, ensuring that chip supply, which as we saw in the pandemic is really critical to a well-functioning economy, is here in the United States and not in Taiwan, which is very vulnerable given our relationship with uh, with China, to the Inflation Reduction Act, which was mostly about climate change. But, you know, there's a lot going on there to, you know, that could address long-term, if you believe it, it, CO2 emissions matter, this this is a really important piece of piece of legislation. So I do think presidents can make a difference there. I don't think they make a big difference in terms of near term, you know, economic activity. I mean, because a lot's out of their control. I mean, the fact that we're going to pay four dollars for a gallon of regular unleaded, you know, pretty tough uh, to blame that or uh, president or give him credit for if it were a lower price. Those are things that are determined in a global marketplace. I mean, maybe some influence there on the on Saudi Arabia because they're a big swing producer, but it's pretty tough. So either in crises, I think absolutely critical, we need that leadership, can have an impact on long-term economic growth given certain kind of circumstances, but near term, probably not. You know, there it's mostly about the Federal Reserve and what, what the Federal Reserve is doing. What do you think, Doug? I'm not going to disagree greatly with that. I think um I, th- I think the crisis management's really important. And I'll give you the most vivid example that I saw of that. Uh, and that was back in uh, 2008. I was on the McCain campaign mm-hmm. and um, we lost and um, we're in the middle That's of. That's how I got to know Doug. Doug, yeah. Doug yes. said, hey, Mark. On the campaign. Mark, yeah, yeah. can you help? I, I, I won't go any further than that, but it was a great experience. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a great help to him. But uh, so so it's a it's a horrible economic situation. We're losing 800,000 jobs a month at, at, in the in late 2008. And in November, there's an election. And the day after the election, Barack Obama is the de facto president, and every question about what should we do goes to him, not the sitting president. And one of the things I've always admired about what he did was he did that incredibly well. He shouldered that leadership responsibility one day after the election, and 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 did a tremendous job of it. And and um, I think it's it's been underappreciated. Hmm. Like, like what a good job he did before it was his job. And, and that was and that was the peak crisis period. Um, so I, I'm all with Mark on that. I, I think the there are there are really critical places where we're not getting things done, and and this president hasn't been able to be successful. But you know, immigration reform is the single most important thing this country could do. I hope the the next president manages to to get something done on that front. That's long term economic growth. That's that's all that's about. Um, and everything else, we're just blaming the guy who happens to be sitting in the chair. We do that all the time. And they, unfortunately, and, and I've worked in two White Houses, they cannot resist the temptation of claiming credit for things they had nothing to do with. So they set themselves up for it. Sure. You said last month you did this. Now, what about this month? You know, it's it's it, it's just part of the politics. Doug's point about immigration reform. Absolutely. Critical. There's no uh, better way to significantly lift both labor force growth and the productivity of that labor force because yeah. immigrants by definition are risk takers and they start companies at a higher rate and they're, they do they're critical to innovation and entrepreneurship. And you can, all, I came back, I was in Canada yesterday uh, in Toronto speaking to a bunch of folks and they're, they're, you know, they have probably the gold standard for immigration and their economy is 3% labor force growth and highly skilled, highly educated, you know, uh, immigrant workers, uh, immigrants from all over the world are coming to Canada and it's making all the difference in their economy. And I think, you know, no better way to kind of get our economy off, get going faster and addressing our long-term fiscal problems because we'll have a stronger economy generating more tax revenue and and yep. and, and reducing the benefits for people who aren't doing as well than immigration reform. 
And this is part of uh, being globally competitive. I mean, we, we are going to have to face this. And the Canadians have stolen our uh, high-skilled immigrants. It's unbelievable. We have a program called H-1B. Don't double click me. It's a it's a program for high-skilled <laughs> immigrants. Um, and we let them come work temporarily. Don't grant them any kind of permanent path to citizenship. And the Canadians looked around and thought, okay, if you've gotten an H-1B in the United States, if you come to Canada, you're here. You're, you're a permanent resident. We'll make you a citizen. And so they're just they're just stealing them in droves. So we, I will say I knew what an H one B as somebody who's worked in higher ed for twenty years I knew yeah. that one, uh, so, but most other things I'm completely ignorant. So I appreciate it. Um, now I just <laughs> want to make sure we don't leave Doug without asking a question about his expertise from two thousand eight and being on the McCain campaign. So in your opinion, can economic proposals kind of and stances really make or break a campaign? Oh, no question about it. Yes. Um, uh, and, and I learned that the hard way, um, no question. Uh, so um, for a long time, academics, and I was an academic for 20 years, have uh, bewailed the fact that employer-sponsored insurance is not taxed. You're given a valuable piece of compensation. It's not subject to tax. We give you cash. It's subject to tax. This distorts compensation packages. It leads to excess consumption of health insurance. You know, but they, there's a standard academic diatribe against this. I wanted to counter uh, the Obama ta- uh, healthcare reforms with a universal opportunity and, and convinced uh, uh, candidate McCain that we should tax employer-sponsored insurance, use the revenue to provide a universally available tax credit for people who wanted to buy health insurance, and in that way, get get on the the universal health insurance uh, train without being single payer, stuff like that. Just let people have it. So this this was the proposal. The Obama campaign ran in a political ad that showed a ball of twine unwinding, saying John McCain is going to tax your health insurance for the first time in, in history and the health insurance and, and your health care will unwind. Wow. It remains to this day, Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post verified this for me, the single most run ad ever in political campaigns mm-hmm. and it killed us so yeah it matters yes and- well it sounds like also marketing matters so thank you for supporting <laughs> my discipline absolutely we did a terrible job of defending it like you know i i'm i'm, I'm thinking like we're explaining to the faculty lounge they'll get this I'm like, how, how hard is this oh we it was horrible and and you know we proposed this in the primary when he got the the the, the nomination the political pros who'd been around the block all the time said, you, you're proposing what? Hmm. Like, they were horrified. <laughs> so, live and learn. Talking about uh, marketing, Kelly, what do you think of Bidenomics? I don't know. What do I think? I don't want to get into my politics on things. <laughs> I don't know. We answer questions. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> right, come on. These are questions for you about economics. You want to ask <laughs> questions about, like, McDonald's new campaign and if they should run the McRib seasonally? I'll talk all day. I'll talk your ear off. What about the shutdown yeah, of the go. Great American Mall? I got all kinds of ideas about distribution. Anything that words <laughs> ends in onomics, uh, I'm I'm useless. Tune out. Okay, <laughs> now, um, speaking of words that end in onomics, back to economic policy. You guys, if if you had complete control over the fate of the United States and you could ban the upcoming presidential candidates from using one economic word or phrase between now and election day, strike it from the record. What would it be and why? Uh. Trickle down anything. <laughs> just because it doesn't mean anything. It and it's and it's now just associated as a a, a a general diatribe against whatever the proposal might be. And 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 it's an excuse for not explaining what you, how you dis- disagree about it. Like for, force there to actually be a discussion of it. So I hate I hate phrases like that. That's funny. I'm going to use that in class. That's just trickle down marketing. And I don't even know if it doesn't mean anything. It'll shut people down. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't understand what that part. means, though. That, that, that's, no, no. In, let me explain. Yeah. The Inflation Reduction Act is nothing but trickle down climate policy. We're just going to give money to big companies and rich people because that's where those tax credits are going to go. And then what, what's going to be a cleaner place? It's just trickle down. I, it's all wrong. So I see if you, if you frame it like that, it, 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 it's, it, it's not useful. Right, but people, you know, traditionally think about it in the context of the haves and the have-nots, and in that context, it's very helpful because we are going to be debating the tax cuts. I mentioned it earlier: the Trump tax cuts sure. for high-income, high-net-worth households is going to expire. 
So how, how, how you know, it's going to be very difficult in the heat of political battle not to use those words because those are the words that people understand. She asked what I wanted to ban. Yeah, yeah okay, gonna, fair enough. But I, I, think, I think it's a that really was the question mark. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with you. It's going to happen. Yeah. I just don't want it to. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I, the thing that I makes me most uncomfortable is, isn't a word, but it's it's, it's a, a, a thinking around walling ourselves off from the rest of the world. You know, mm. tariffs, uh, pulling away, y- using China as a kind of a whipping boy for everything that's wrong. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, border walls, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Things that kind of make uh, the U.S. Uh, more inwardly focused. Uh, I think that's it's not one word. It's just a way of thinking that makes me really uncomfortable um, because I think, you know, our future really depends on our ability to uh, engage with the rest of the world. Right. in in a productive way. And we got to figure out how to do that. And pulling away, you know, I just think is asking for trouble, both from an economic perspective, but from a geopolitical perspective, it's just, you know, if we can, you know, the closer we're connected economically, this less likely we're going to hit ourselves over the head militarily, in my view. So, you know, I, I think if we could just stay away from that, I know that's going to be almost impossible to do, but that would be my, you know, yeah. uh, wish in my wish list. Yeah, I, and I think the same critique applies. They are definitely going to do that. Nothing unites the parties like the desire to blame China. Hmm. It's the only common element of of the dis- discourse right right now. Well, you were you were invited to give your wish list, so thank you both for that. Now we typically I'm getting pinged that or that we're at time, so we typically like to end these discussions by asking our esteemed panelists about what listeners can do to put some of the ideas we've talked about into practice as active participants in the American democratic process. So to both of you, I would like to tweak this question just a little bit and ask you, in your opinion. What will be the biggest economic challenges facing today's Vanderbilt students when they get that diploma? And what advice would you give them on how to prepare for it? I believe the greatest challenge will be the the federal budget outlook, which is fundamentally unsustainable. Spending is way above revenues as far as I can see is fundamentally stacked against economic growth because the places where you can invest in the future, infrastructure, education, get short shrift compared to legacy programs of the past, and which is stacked against representative democracy because they're not going to be able to have any new programs. All the money is spoken for by things that were done in 1965. It strikes me as unfair and dangerous, and and that's our greatest challenge. You know, Kelly, I, I would... um I would say remain engaged. You know, one thing I've noticed is young people, certainly relative to what what, it's a long time ago when I was a young person, uh, but it just feels like they're less engaged in the process, the political process. And and maybe it's understandable, you know, because of the environment that that we're in and uh, the kind of information they're bombarded with and the vitriol and you know, it just feels pretty ugly and they don't want to be part of that. But at the end of the day, we need smart people, young people to remain engaged and to participate and and change it in a way that is going to work for them in the long run. I mean, to address Doug's point about our fiscal challenges, to address the challenges of climate change, to address, you know, our immigration policy. I mean, these are complex things, but you can't change them unless you're part of the process, unless you're engaged in the process. So, to me, that's the single most important thing for someone gra- graduating from university. Get involved, be engaged, be part of the process, be part of the answer, because goodness knows uh, if you're not, uh, it's going to go down a dark path. Well, hopefully everyone tuning in today is hearing that as a call to action, because I think that's an excellent point to end on. If you care enough to tune in and listen to what these two smart economists have to say, care enough to get involved, care enough to be engaged, and care enough to move things forward for your generation and the generations to come. So I love that advice, Mark. Uh, Now, thank you both again for joining us today for Ask an Economist, Where Are We Now?, hosted by the Vanderbilt Project on Unity and American Democracy. Thanks to Mark. Thanks to Doug for sharing your insights and answering our audience members' questions about economics. 
The Vanderbilt Project on Unity and American Democracy regularly hosts events to enhance Americans' capacity for civic engagement by advocating for adjudicating disagreements through relevant facts and data. For information on the project and to view past events, please visit vanderbilt.edu forward slash unity. Thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm.